Thank you. I'm probably a sideshow within a sideshow, though it was can be called. Uh, the air war over the Adriatic shouldn't be entirely unfamiliar to the gang over here because I have touched on it before when it came to my book on naval aces because a significant number arose over the Adriatic front in spite of the fact that uh, most of them were in flying boats, which is what makes this a somewhat interesting air war. It was uh, the Flanders Front, as you probably know, uh, was largely patrolled offshore by British flying boats and German float planes, some of them being fighters. And there's a whole air war going on there. Over the Adriatic, however, the primary aircraft in use were <coughs> flying boats. And it takes on a bit of a strange aspect to see these streamlined hulls with two wings stacked above them and a, usually a pusher engine in between. Uh, it almost looks incongruous. They look like speed boats with a, with a sandwich on top. And flying about in a stately fashion over the rough seas of the Adriatic looking for submarines one of which was uh, flown by the, was skippered by the patriarch of the von Trapp family, or attacking fishing boats that were strung out across the Gulf of Otranto with the intention of preventing Austro-Hungarian submarines from getting beyond the northern Adriatic. And all throughout this, uh, flying boats are taking each other on some of them modified into the seemingly incongruous, at least in retrospect, phenomenon of the flying boat fighter, which until Saunders Road tried vainly to co come up with a jet variation at the end of World War II, uh, you generally just find hard to conceive anymore until Saunders Road got this bright idea for a little while, but that's another story. <laughs> In any case, uh, it is probably the Austro-Hungarian Empire that is most responsible for starting this. Uh, Jakob Lohner came up with an excellent, for their time, series of uh, boats. Of uh, which an example is the E-type. E-17 is shown there, and which made history in a manner that most people are totally unaware of. There were about 40 of them built by 1914. They were powered by an 85 horsepower Hero engine. They could do 65 miles per hour, and they could stay in the air for four hours. In, on July 28th, 1914, the first of a series of these aircraft were patrolling and photographing Montenegrin artillery positions, and they kept this up until August 2nd. They were operating out of Kumbor, and it just so happens that this was the first use of military aircraft in combat capacity in World War I. Flying boats. Who knew? Well, not those who focus on the Western Front, but that was the case. Furthermore, on August 16th, a loner flown by Linienschiffsleutnant Konstantin Maglic and uh, crewed by Oberleutnant Peeler in E-18 dropped two bombs on Christatz, Montenegro, the first use of a flying boat as a bomber. <coughs> And there will be more of that in the future. Uh, this set the pattern for what would be a bit of a, a, uh, a, a weapons rivalry, which would get jump-started just three days after Italy entered the war, when one of the loners uh, 
I believe is the next one I'll be showing here, if this thing will cooperate. Uh, yes, L40 happened to uh, have engine trouble and fell into Italian hands, and the Italians, uh, this was just on May 27th, Italy had declared war on the 24th, bad news for Austria-Hungary because the Italian Navy immediately wanted it reverse engineered into an Italian variant. Maki, which had had no experience with flying boats before, got the job. And I guess this was a bit less complicated than Andrei Tupilov had on his hands when he was ordered to reverse engineer a B-29 into a Soviet strategic bomber <laughs> after World War II. Maki was able to come up with its own version, replacing the 160 horsepower Austro Daimler engine that gave the L version a 65 mile per hour top speed and a 375 mile range, and the ability to carry up to 200 kilograms of bombs. They replaced it with the 150 horsepower Isotta Fraschini V4A engine. They built 14 of them, then reduced the wingspan to produce the L2 and gave that a 160 horsepower uh, V4B engine. Uh, it could carry four light <coughs> bombs. They built 10, but then uh, redesigned it further with a refined hull and tail assembly to produce the L3 which went to a record uh, flying boat altitude of 17,700 feet in 41 minutes and could do 90 miles per hour in 1916. Uh, at about that same time, the Italians ordered Maki to start referring it to it as an M3 rather than an L3 because at this point, this was not a loner, this was a Maki, damn it. And from then on, Italy was building its own aircraft. And as was the case with Tupelov and Boeing, starting from the same B-29 basis, uh, would be evolving in two different directions. In the meantime, uh, the here's a uh, L-48 in action. This is another of uh, those of, uh, which was uh, involved in another historic moment for the, uh, the aircraft. Uh, one of the more historic ones occurred on September 16, 1915. Uh, at this point, the loners were also being built by Hansa Brandenburg and UFAG or the Ungarische Flugzeug Allgemeine Gesellschaft in Budapest. And a couple of UFOG built uh, boats, L-132 was patrolling the uh, northern Adriatic when its crew, they were operating out of Kumbor near Dorazzo, when uh, Linian Schiffsleutnant Dmitri Akunjevich and forgotten Lieutenant Maximilian Severa saw what looked like a submarine operating about 10 meters below the surface of the water. They rushed back to Kumbor to report and to get another flying boat with uh, some 10 kilogram bombs and a, some uh, 50 kilogram depth charges, L-135, flown by forgotten Lieutenant Walter Zelezny with uh, forgotten Lieutenant Otto Freiherr von Klimberg as his observer, get over on the scene ASAP, as ASAP as flying boats can. They found that sub under the surface and uh, they promptly attacked. Here's a, this is an example of one of the uh, Italian built uh, loner or Maki L or M3s. And another combatant that was 
this is a uh, yet another uh, M3. This one is obviously operating uh, out of Venice with the squadrilla marking being the line of St. Mark. National insignia? Which country? Uh, well, the national insignia is Italian, but the line of St. Mark indicates that it's operating out of Venice. <coughs> and the French, this is an Italian one, but the FBA C and H flying boats, uh, which was a Franco British creation, were operated. Uh, from 1916 on out of uh, San Andrea, outside of Venice, by a French uh, Centre des Avions Maritimes, but in this case it's an Italian one with, a, uh, with an Italian cruiser in the background. And on the Austro-Hungarian side, this is a typical, a not-so-typical L machine. Uh, this one was modified into the first flying boat fighter by its pilot, an Irish fellow by the name of Godfrey Thomas Banfield, who in 1903 decided to follow in his father's footsteps and become a career officer in the Royal and Imperial Austro-Hungarian Navy, by becoming an Austrian citizen and acquiring the name of Gottfried Banfield. In uh, April 1916, he was put, having shot down a balloon while flying L-47, which you'd seen earlier, uh, he acquired L-16 here as commander of Trieste, or at least the Flugstation there, and decided to uh, dispense with an observer, bolt a single 8mm Schwarzlose machine gun alongside him and fly the thing solo. And that was pretty much how he uh, began his deadly career as the leading Austro-Hungarian uh, naval ace. On the evening of June 23rd, uh, Banfield attacked a French FBA Type C, like the one you'd seen earlier, over the Gulf of Trieste, fatally striking the Italian observer, second capo Gramati Capolo, in the head and heart, forced it to land, but the French pilot, Enzyme de Vaisseau, Première Classe André Victor Vaugeois, tried to... Uh, get back to his base in Grotto on the Italian side until Banfield's gunfire crippled his engine. The Frenchman then manned the flexible machine gun and fired a hundred rounds until Banfield struck him in the neck. Then br the Austro-Hungarians uh, towed his plane back. Uh, the Frenchman recovered and uh, Banfield invited him to dinner where he toasted his courage. The, uh, the FBA was taken to be displayed in Vienna. On August 1st, Banfield struck again when he in intercepted a formation of Caproni CA-1 bombers attacking Fiumi. He forced one to crash land on the Velasca parade grounds where the crew was taken prisoner. Five days later, still in L-16, Banfield joined loner L-99 in attacking a Caproni of the 4th Squadrilla Arreplani over Miramare. A bullet struck L-99's radiator, putting it out of it, forcing it to glide back to Trieste. But being, Banfield shot out all three of its engines and it crashed into a house southeast of Sinistiana. On the night of August 9th, Banfield led 21 flying boats from Trieste and its substations to Punta Sella, 
Casada and Barenzo in a bombing raid on Venice, during which a bomb actually fell near the British submarine B-10, and in the process of trying to repair the damage, apparently the British set off a spark that set off fumes that caused the submarine to blow up and sink. <laughs> On August 15th, Banfield shot down two French FBA type H's. The crew of the first was wounded, the other enseigne de vaisseau Baron Jean Roulier, who happened to be the commander of the uh, all French naval units, uh, air units on the Azonso front, and his mécanicien I.H. Costa Russe, were killed. <coughs> At this point, Banfield was a genuine flying boat ace. So here's a shot of Banfield showing his bolted down machine gun. And the next picture is the FBA Type C that was his first French victim in Austro Hungarian hands. So basically, he flew it like a, a fighter. He flew it straight on at the end. Yes, he did. Cool. Right. He, obviously, with a pusher engine, he didn't have to worry about. Uh, synchronization or shooting off his own prop. Another Austrian ace was uh, Friedrich Lang, who I've mentioned before. During an Italian air raid on, near Dorazzo, he and his observer were credited with bringing down a couple of Italian farmans, which it turns out were also oh, among the farmers that were credited to Julius Arigi and Johann Lassi, his observer in a Brandenburg, which also attacked the Italians. And he was credited with five. The Italians claim no more than three even brought down. So there's a bit of a discrepancy there, but it wouldn't be the first or last with the Austro-Hungarians. Interestingly enough, though, after having heroically attacked all these uh, Italian farmans, as soon as Arigi came back, his commander received three consecutive uh, telephone calls from headquarters in Vienna that had nothing more to say than, why was the pilot allowed to take off without an officer in the back pit? <laughs> that was the difference between the Austro-Hungarians and the Germans when it came to rank. Uh, there were no officers around, and Arigi just couldn't stay on the ground while the Italians were about to bomb his base. So he grabbed uh, Lassi, a mechanic, who had sometimes served as an observer and who turned out to be a good shot. And the rest is uh, embarrassing history for his commander. Here's a look at uh, L-131, which Lung and his observer were flying at the time of his uh, first two victories. And there's L-135, which brings me back to the occasion that I'd uh, somewhat gotten off out of whack with. Uh, this was flown by Jelazny and uh, Klimberg. They found the submarine 10 miles southeast of Punta Dostro and promptly attacked with their depth charges. The best they could do was get a, a, uh, an explosion about 7 meters away from the shadowy sub, but it did enough damage to cause the French to first, who were aboard it, it turned out to be the French Foucault. They took her down, but it soon became clear that they were going to end uh, up f down there forever if they didn't uh, reconsider. The sub surfaced, and uh, both Austro-Hungarians landed, but then Konjevic, this is a uh, depiction of the situation they had on hand. Uh, Konjevic took off, went back to Kumbor to roust up a torpedo boat to get down to the scene. 
Uh, meanwhile, Jelazny and Klimberg took the French commanding officer, uh, Capitaine Léon-Henri Devin, and his executive officer aboard and flew them to Cumbor. And then uh, the two guided the torpedo boat to rescue the rest of the French. You were in pretty good... Uh, you're in pretty good shape if you're an officer, of course, but as for the rest of the crew, yes, they did end up uh, rescuing all 27 of Foucault's crewmen, as well as the two officers, who are shown in white with their two rescuers after L-135 returned to Kumbor. Not only were the uh, crews who sank the first submarine to fall victim to an aerial attack, in case you're wondering what I was ultimately getting at here. But the French recognized uh, the, uh, the two flying boat crews for having rescued all of uh, Foucault's crew. I might also add that I have discovered that both Konjevic and Jelazny were of Serbian extraction. And you may wonder, since what started World War I was that Austro-Hungary declared war on Serbia, and what are a couple of Serbs doing entrusted as officers and gentlemen in the uh, KUK Kriegsmarine? All I can say as a person who's been there is, welcome to the Balkans. It's complicated. <laughs> they may have been ethnically Serb, but they, their nationality was Austro-Hungarian, and I believe the same can be said for Konstantin Maglic. They, it seems that people living up in that gray area between, in the Balkans between Ital what is now Italy and, say, Slovenia, Dalmatia, Croatia, and so forth, Whatever side of the border you were on, it uh, was the side you took, and apparently a lot of people living there found careers in the Navy. And uh, apparently they served their country pretty well. Well, getting on with uh, the war, as I said, I can only do some examples of what, how things developed. And when it comes to developing, uh, having with the precedent of Banfield's success with L L16, the uh, both sides escalated a war to come up with a a more purpose-built flying boat fighter. An example was the Hansa Brandenburg CC which uh, referred to uh, Cas Camilo Castiglione, the uh, owner of uh, Hansa Brandenburg, among others, they came up with a smaller flying boat, more compact, two machine guns, and a, uh, the same star strutter arrangement that had worked so badly on the uh, D-1 fighter, and Gottfried Banfield flew this particular plane bearing the Opwehr, or defense number 824, to score another victory over his opponents. And during the triplane craze, trust Hansa Brandenburg to get in on the action with a triplane version, the A-45, which, as you may guess, amounted to nothing, as so many triplanes did. They built the one, and it did not go into production. Uh, here's yet another example of a loner flying boat in action. It does have a certain stately elegance to it, even though it's hard to conceive of this thing being a deadly uh, device, but it was. What's that thing under the left wing? It's a pontoon. It's a pontoon. Stabilizer. Right. Thank you. Yes, yeah, sure. Another uh, single-seat 
device uh, they came up with was the Erfog a Type H, developed by, uh, designed by Josef Mittel. And once again, it was a uh, fairly sturdy uh, single seater with a fixed machine gun, and it was used by uh, Banfield on the night of May 31st, 1917, to shoot down an Allied flying boat near the mouth of the Primero River. The Italians were able to get to it and tow it back to Grotto. Nevertheless, this was the first night victory scored by any Austro-Hungarian. Uh, Banfield had the plane painted blue all over, which he thought would uh, better camouflage it. He referred to it as his bluebird, and he was very happy with its performance, and he pushed to have it put into mass production. For some reason known only to themselves, they did not. The Italians, in the meantime, over at Maki, were also working on a fighter of their own, and they produced what is arguably the most successful and highest performance uh, flying boat fighter of the war, the M5. One can Maki had been building Newports under license, and you can see a certain amount of Newport influence in the V-strut arrangement that they have for the wings, although it's considerably more reinforced. The tail is rather more substantial compared with that massive uh, struts that hold them up. And as will be seen, the, uh, the M5's performance could often be surprising. It was capable of getting up to 115 miles per hour. And would become, uh, and more would be mass produced, 348, than any flying boat uh, of either combatant. It was also flown by s at least three aces, one of whom is shown here uh, Guardia Marina Umberto Calvello, shown on the right with his personal plane, which Besides the number two, bears a popular figure in Italian comic books, uh, Fortunello, based on the happy hooligan. And for some reason, the Venetians uh, seem to have loved this uh, curse of Ocho Fieldoncani, which means uh, watch out, you son of a bitch. It also appears on French aircraft based in Venice. I don't know what it is about these Venetians. <laughs> Another uh, ace who scored five victories, and it, mind you, most of these were shared, was uh, Tenente Di Vassello Federico Martinengo who commanded the 260th Squadrilla at San Andrea from December 1917 to June 1918. And the leading Italian ace for the Navy was uh, Orazio Pierozzi, who commanded, actually a, ended up leading two groups. He scored his first victory in an FBA and the remaining six in Maki M5s. Another development in the flying boat war was the Hansa Brandenburg W-13, a rather large boat with a 66-foot span and capable of carrying enough bombs for it to raid as a bomber. This became the aircraft that would often be raiding Venice itself, the way Gotas would be trying to raid uh, London. It was not an entirely successful design, although it was subcontracted out to uh, Lohner and Ufog. The problem was that to, to carry all that size and weight, it had a 360 horsepower Austro-Daimler engine, 
which they developed. But at that stage of the war, Austria-Hungary's stocks of decent lubricant were waning, and the engine became so unreliable that out of the 160 built, a little more than half of them even arrived with engines. And the engines they did have, as the war wore on, became increasingly uh, undependable. What was your designation of that plane again, please? The W-13 was uh, what the plane was called, but their serial numbers usually had a K for Kampfwasserflugzeug, or battle plane, because their primary role was bombing. This should give you an idea of the size, and notice the V-shaped arrangement of the truss struts. It looks fairly sturdy, but its Achilles heel was apparently its engine, and a number of them fell to grief when attacked. Here's another, sh this is a shot of an Italian uh, two-seater, the uh, Machi M8 which was Italy's uh, reconnaissance bomber answer to the W-13. And I believe I may have uh, covered this before. This is an incident that occurred in, uh, on May 4th, 1918, when uh, the Italians had a dogfight, M-5s versus W-18s. The Brandenburg W-18 was a development of the CC with more conventional struts. And this, what this was was a dogfight that turned out to be a dogfight between aces. It's a uh, rather remarkable action for its time in retrospect uh, because it involved some of the uh, crack pilots uh, it's, this uh, spate of fighting started on May 1st when Pierozzi claimed his first success since he got command of the 261st Squadrilla. He led three M5s escorting an L3 on a photo reconnaissance mission to Trieste, spotted an enemy seaplane over Grotto on the return leg of the flight and attacked it. With other Machis cutting off the escape route, the pilot of A-69, Fenrich in der Reserve, Josef Niedermeyer, put a few rounds into Pierozzi's flying boat before his engine was set on fire and he was forced to land. He nevertheless evaded capture. But on May 4th, he was up again in uh, W-18A-91 along with uh, three other W-18s to challenge another L-3 on a photo recon mission over Punta Salvore. Pierozzi was again leading a five-flying boat escort, but during the melee that came up, true leader that he was, he, uh, he flew above the action and kept an eye on the others and let them have what they ended up uh, claiming three victories in. One of the ones who was shot down was Niedermeyer, who this time would be captured by an Italian torpedo boat. The pilot of A-78 here, uh, a Hungarian named Flieger uh, Cadet uh, Ferenc Burish, spotted an Italian flying boat circling over Niedermeyer's plane and attacked it, but failed to watch his six and found himself under attack by four more M3s. He was struck several times, forced down, and also captured, and towed back to San Andrea. As was Niedermeyer's plane, where uh, the Italians were able to look it over with great interest. Uh, there's Calvello sitting on... Uh, he was one of those who shared in the victory along with uh, Andrea Rivieri, Marinaio Guido Gianello, and one of my favorite names in the Italian Naval Air Service, Giuseppe Pagliacci, of whom you will hear 
more in future. But uh, the third victory, the damage W18882 came down and uh, managed to come down in Austro-Hungarian controlled waters. And the Italians would never know that the one that got away was being flown by none other than Leninschiftsleutnant Gottfried Banfield. They almost got the uh, leading Austro-Hungarian ace. Uh, that day's fight brought Martinengo's tally to five. On June 8th, he would be uh, reassigned from uh, fighters to director of special courses, so he didn't get his a moment too soon. Uh, Calvello would later get his fifth. Pierozzi would, uh, at that point, add two victories to his credit, but that was about to change. Well, before I get into this unit, on May 14, 1918, the experimental track torpedo vessel Grio made an unsuccessful attempt to crawl over the anti-submarine nets to attack Pola Harbor to try and get at the battleship Viribus Unitis. Italian warships covering the operation came under attack by two loner bombers, escorted by four W-18s. They were jumped by Pierozzi, who was leading five M5s of the 261st Squadriglia. The K-boats dropped their bombs and fled, and in the clash of fighters, the Italians again claimed three victories. The Austrians only recorded two. Uh, W-18A-70 force landed in the sea where Flugmat Josef Gindel was rescued. His plane was then destroyed by the torpedo boat that saved him. A-85 crashed, killing Zay Cadet Franz Pichel, who, uh, who, a picture of whom was later recovered and preserved in an album by Pierozzi with words of sorrow on his part about his fate. And then on May 19th, 261st Squadrilia's Machis were escorting two recon uh, float plane, uh, reconnaissance uh, flying boats to Polo when they were intercepted by four Phoenix D-1 land fighters led by Friedrich Lahn in A-115. The Austrians were credited with two of the M-5s. The Italians recorded only one loss, an M-5 flown by Umberto Magaldi, who was found drifting 17 miles west of Rovigno in TB-81, which took the pilot aboard and then sank the flying boat. On the 22nd, Pierozzi and Nociere Beniamino Piro of the 260th Squadrilla were on a recon mission to Polo when they were again attacked by two Phoenix D-1s off Rovigno. Long was leading again in A-110, but on this occasion, the Maquis held their own against their land-based opponents amazingly well. Perhaps it was the cooperative tactics between the Italians. But the only casualty of the fight would be one of the Austrians. Uh, forgotten Leutnant Stefan Volaman, who was wounded, but managed to uh, make it back to Pola before he crash-landed A-115 offshore. Between combats, Pierozzi would spend May and June 1918 uh, test flying such things as the Ario HD-1 float plane and the ISVA, which was a, uh, a float plane version of the SVA-5 that proved disappointing. And then on June 15th, Pierozzi led his M5s in support of the Allied defense at uh, during the final Austro-Hungarian assault on the Piave. Uh, on July 2nd, a uh, K-394, an Austro-Hungarian uh, W-13 boat, was escorted by three fighters, tried to attack the Italian torpedo boats off Kaorole, 
when five uh, of the M5s led by Piorozzi attacked the formation. Piorozzi brought the bomber down in flames, although its crew, Zeyfenrich Vincenz Giulielmi, an Italian in Austrian service, and uh, Emil Modler and Flieg Matrosa Niboda survived to be taken prisoner. At this point, Piorozzi's score was seven, and he was their leading naval ace but he would continue to uh, serve throughout the war, only to be killed in World War II. Polo would continue to be a tough nut to crack for the Italians, and likewise for another ally who would appear on the scene. At this point, uh, af especially after the failures of the many Italian pushes along the Asonso, the Allies began sending reinforcements to the Italians, and with Venice constantly under attack by these Austro-Hungarian flying boat bombers, the French sent an escadrille of land fighters to assist them. Initially called N-92 and then renamed N-392 in June 1916, this unit uh, ended up scoring 12 victories, often in collaboration with their uh, float plane colleagues. Here's an example of one of the Newport 23s that they flew, this particular one with the bulldog motif. In this case, everybody had his own personal marking within the unit. This was flown by the leading ace of the unit, uh, Sergeant André Lévy a Parisian, of whom more later. <coughs> to give an example of the French contribution here from this unit, on October 23, 1916, Sous-Lieutenant Xavier Garot uh, brought down L-138, whose uh, crew, Ferenc Virani, was taken prisoner, but whose observer, E.F. Hoch, was killed. Um, they, he was aided on this occasion by a Maki L-2 flown by uh, Soto Tenente di Vassello Federico Martinengo and uh, also by Daniele Monziotti, who was uh, serving as a radio telegraphist on the plane. The Italians were doing that sort of thing too, Carl. Um, April 17, 1917, Xavier Garot and Lieutenant René Robert, as well as Soldat Francois Salbreu, they were together, they were flying a Newport 10 2 seater, brought down K192 east of Venice. There would be a number of air battles over possession of. K-192, which turned over when it trot force landed in the water, and its two crewmen uh, were forced to, uh, uh, an Austrian named Plankner and a Hungarian named Sechenyi, were pretty much uh, riding on their capsized fuselage while French, Italian, and Austro-Hungarian aircraft were battling out to see who would get a, uh, a torpedo boat out there first to rescue and, or capture these two. Uh, the weather turned bad that afternoon, and one, one of the French aircraft crashed, killing its two crewmen. Two Italian flying boats landed nearby to K-192, but then they too were uh, turned over in the rough seas, Long story short, an Austro-Hungarian torpedo boat finally came along, rescued its men, and captured the Italians. So what started out as a good day ended up being a bad one for the Allies, with, the, uh, with them losing more aircraft just for having tried to uh, seal the deal with K-192. On June 1st, 1917, uh, the unit was redesignated again as N-561, L'Escadrille de Venise. And on 
August 14, 1917, Maréchal de Logis, Maurice de Joffre de Champrignac, attacked uh, during an attack on Venice, brought down K203, and uh, he strafed it thereafter, wounding one of its crew, but Austro-Hungarian torpedo boats reached it, scuttled it, and rescued the crew. August 28th, Maréchal de Logis André Loiseau de Grand Maison brought down a Brandenburg fighter, A-14, in the Gulf of Trieste, killing Zeyfenrich Bruno von Stansky Stanagrad. On October 25th, uh, sous-lieutenant Mar Marcel Robert brought down K-221, killing its crew at Miramare. Aided by sous-lieutenant Jean-Jacques Darbeau, who for some reason was not sh allowed to share the credit, Robert would later score one victory on the Western Front with N1, uh, Spa 124, the French one after the Lafayette Escadrille had turned American, and he would later score the only victory for Spa 164. I would meet him in Paris and uh, interview him about that, but... That would be another story, too. On November 17, 1917, Sergeant André Lévy and Maréchal de Lugy, Edouard Cornillon, <coughs> brought down one of the float plane bombers at Cortalazzo and then strafed it near the two torpedo boats that were trying to rescue the crew. That was Lévy's first victory. On the same day, Sully de Jean Bignon, and two M5s flown by uh, Paolo Mortera and Timoniere Arturo Zanetti brought down a flying boat at the Lower Piave. On June 21, 1918, Levy with Cornillon, Henri Boyer, uh, Sottotenente Ivo Ravanozzi and our friend Giuseppe Pagliacci all collaborated to destroy a balloon near the Piave. On July 20th, Levy would shoot down two more balloons. On August 5th, Levy and Maréchal de Logis René Autissier burned another balloon. So uh, we can see uh, Levy was getting a case of balloon fever at this point. Uh, this is a picture of Levy, of whom a little more will be heard, but meanwhile we will focus on another aspect of the war. Uh, these pictures were taken at Porto Corsini by uh, Lieutenant Commander Willis B. Haviland, a former member of the Lafayette Escadrille, who, after the dissolution of N-124, joined the Navy and ended up in command of an American fighter squadron made up of Maki M5s operating out of there. He took these pictures of a uh, Caproni triplane, which was involved in the bombing of the Austro-Hungarian ports on the other side of the Adriatic. And there's a picture of Haviland in his naval uniform. This was taken about the end of the war, <coughs> when his unit had adopted the Navy goat as their emblem and were adding all sorts of extravagant personal markings the way some of the Italians did. Here's another of their decorative planes. It's, I don't believe it's certain who flew Jeff here. Are they flying Italian colors? Yes, they were. They were wearing the... Uh, the red, white, and green rather than the red, white, and blue, I guess to ease uh, recognition. But uh, nevertheless, they were all being flown by Americans. Uh, here is a major protagonist. In the first combat that would be fought by the unit, which occurred in uh, August 1918, The, uh, the unit arrived on July 24th, 
On the 21st, their first mission involved a Maki M8, crewed by Ensign Walter White and Ensign Albert Talaferro, escorted by five M5s. They would drop propaganda leaflets over Poland. In characteristics of response, the Austro-Hungarian phoenixes took off to dispute that, and uh, Friedrich Lang, by this time with five victories to his credit, was in the lead again with forgotten Leutnant Stefan Volemann, who had recovered from his wounds from his being shot down back in May, in M A-118, and Emil Promberger in A-111, and forgot uh, Flugmat Josef Gindel in A-102. He apparently had also recovered from his shoot-down. As the Austrians made for the M8, the leader of the M5 escorts, Ensign George Ludlow, who in this picture taken by Haviland, uh, unlike the picture in my book, shows him with uh, the mask off, signaled his pilots to dive on the enemy boats. Uh, Ensign Dudley Voorhees was unable to follow due to jammed guns. Ensign's Austin G. Parker, another former Lafayette Flying Corps member, and landsman for Quartermaster Charles Hazeltine Hammond did join in the, in the fight. At 2,500 meters, Ludlow fired on Long's Phoenix, which dived away. Parker pursued him until a jam in his right gun forced him to pull up. He then emptied his left gun at two other assailants. Ludlow reported that he apparently perforated the radiator of one opponent, and Voorhees recorded seeing it trailing smoke. That would be Gimbel, who retired actually after spontaneous combustion of his phosphorus ammunition. He force landed safely near anti aircraft batteries at uh, Valandon. At that point, other Austrians attacked Ludlow, and Volemann smashed his magneto, hold the propeller, and punctured the radiator and crankcase. The Maquis descended in flames. Volemann and Promberger disengaged at 500 meters and turned for home, and Volemann was duly credited with his only victory of the war. Uh, here's a picture of Volemann with one of the Phoenix D1s and a close-up of the victorious pilot. At that point, though, choppy three foot uh, Ludlow, in the course of the dive, had extinguished his flames. He force landed five miles from Pola. At that point, Hammond landed his own damaged M5 alongside Ludlow, and after uh, Ludlow kicked holes in his hull and wings, uh, Hammond took off with Ludlow lying flat on his stomach under the radiator, holding on to the engine mount struts. <laughs> Ludlow's Maki sank just as the Austro-Hungarian destroyer Chikosh arrived to salvage it. <laughs> Had to go back empty-handed. Choppy three-foot swells had so damaged the bow of Hammond's boat that it nosed over when it got back to Porto Corsini. Uh, he was trapped in a safety belt, but Ludlow dove under and managed to get it loose. From, uh, for having saved his squadron mate from the very jaws of the enemy, Hammond, in his Maki M5, built by the Italians and with Italian markings, shown at the right in this picture with an Italian colleague uh, who I uh, have identified as uh, Reiseis. At this point, he had been just promoted to Ensign, and he's shown with a HD-1. Uh, this photo was also taken by... Uh, Willis Haviland. His partner is Luigi de Reces. Uh, Hammond became the first American to be awarded the Medal of Honor for aerial combat. 
And uh, Porto Corsini would continue to give good service for the rest of the war. Uh, getting back to N561, this brings us to our last photo. Or does it? How do I get this back? Launch it again. Huh? Punch it again. the one after that. Yeah, here we go. Uh, to give another idea of the kind of spirit that guided the pilots on the Adriatic front, uh, Sergeant André Lévy apparently was quite a uh, firebrand who was also uh, consumed with balloon fever at this point. On September 16, 1918, by now flying a SPAD-13, as a matter of fact, the only SPAD-13 in the Escadrille, he went after another balloon west of Sejia, and his luck finally ran out. Yes, he blew up the balloon for his sixth victory, but his, he was apparently hit by anti-aircraft fire, or his engine simply gave out with a SPAD-13, you can never tell which. In any case, he had to come down, and he deliberately flipped the plane over trying to destroy it rather than let the Austro-Hungarians have it. As you can see, uh, he wasn't entirely successful in wrecking it as he would have wished, but the Austrians took him prisoner they sent him to a POW camp in Bohemia. Levy and a fellow prisoner escaped. They were recaptured, put in another prison camp. Levy escaped again, and in the confusion that was attending the uh, Austro-Hungarian collapse in the wake of the Battle of Vittorio Veneto, he made partially his way down by train, talking as little as possible and trying to pass himself off as a civilian, and then finally made his way across the Alps on foot to rejoin his unit on November 5th. Uh, needless to say, he would eventually get the ship, become a Chevalier de la Légion d'Honneur for this. Well, by the end of the war, of course, the Austro-Hungarians were pretty well done anyway, but they certainly left a strange legacy in what could be called a sideshow of aerial combat. Nevertheless, it had been an interesting war, and I've only touched on a few of the incidents that made it interesting. Apparently, it did have a certain amount of appeal to a certain Japanese director, who uses flashbacks of that war in a movie he did about a char an Italian character named Porco Rosso. But that would be another story, and if anyone can get a hold of it, you can... Uh, there is a scene where Machis and uh, Brandenburg CCs are having a dogfight on a scale that I don't think ever existed over the Adriatic before we go into uh, Porco Rosso's uh, adventures in the 1920s. But that's, uh, those are just some aspects of uh, a sideshow within a sideshow within a sideshow. Any questions?